Okay, let's go ahead and get started. First of all, any questions on um, the material? We're going to go to the homework in a second, but I just wonder in general in the material. Okay, if there is none, I think I'll go ahead and share my screen. And uh, I think that we'll probably go over, let's see. Okay, can you see the spreadsheet? Give me a thumbs up if you can. Okay, that's good. This is homework number two. And I wondered if, uh, if there was any questions on any of these, which are going to be due on uh, the next time that we meet. Oh, is this it's not due today? No, it isn't due today. Today is the day oh. that we talk about it. Oh, okay. Cool. You, you, usually I'm going to allow for two days, um, usually one day for discussion in case you have any questions. Uh, and then the next, and then the next time we meet, we'll do the coin flipping. Except for number three, uh, we, we're going to go through the different, the different ands and ors that are listed in Clear and Folger, and check out things about this item potence and associativity and other properties. So we'll go through that uh, that next time. Uh, and we'll go through this one at a time. This is something which is each one of you has been assigned one. I hope you remember which one you were assigned because I didn't write it down. Okay, any questions on these at all? Well, I mean, it's not so much a question, but I've been having a lot of difficulty with number four. Oh, okay. Have you looked in the clear and fold your notes? Oh, no, I didn't realize it was in there. Yeah, take a look at the clear and fold your notes. I am almost certain that it is in there. Has anybody else done this? Colin, you've done it? I thought I saw you raise your hand. Yeah. Um, did you look at clear and fold or did you figure out kind of how to do it yourself? No, I, I kind of played around with it for a bit. Uh-huh. Um, and then, yeah, I think you mentioned we had to use look at tells rule and so that... Um, that was sort of the key piece to the puzzle. Yeah, the key piece to the puzzle is I think that first of all, you have to write this down and you have to take the logarithm of it. Did you take the log of it? If I, if I remember, I took the log in order to, uh, in order to get the result and then applied lo the logarithm to, look to um, this general aggregation operator and use Lahupatao's rule on the logarithm. It just turned out to be mathematically more easy. Uh, anybody else get it? Or anybody else had a big bump in doing it? Did anybody else try it? Okay, okay, the truth is out. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it's the idea of uh, looking at this, taking, I, I believe if I remember right, taking the logarithm of it and then using the Hopital's rule. And I believe that the solution is in clear and Folger. Okay. So take a look there. Any other, any other questions on the homework? Uh, just one quick clarifying question about uh, question three. So parts B and D. Yeah. Um, in Clear and Folger, it kind of gives the definition of item potence as something that looks like B. I was curious if we had a different definition here. Yeah, I'm wondering about that. I think that they're they're equivalent to each other. So I, I think I double double booked here. So I put this down and then put item potence. So let's let's get rid of uh, D, which and look at B as item potence. Okay. Does anybody agree with that or disagree with that? I would have to look back and see about. Uh, I didn't equivalence. look at I didn't look at the clear and folder definition, but intuitively, uh, I thought item potence would be if you did the intersection of a and a, and then did that again with a. Uh, no matter how many times you do the intersection of a with itself, you always have the same result. Okay, so it's a, so it's more iterative in terms of the item potence. Right, but I think. Uh, in order for it to be item potent, it would have to also satisfy B. Yeah, so it's a necessary um, but not a sufficient condition, right? Yeah, I mean, that's just intuitively how I think about it, but I'm sure there's a definition okay. in the paper. Okay. I think it would be a necessary and sufficient. Um, you can just apply the result in B twice, and I think that should give you 
Yeah, I think you're. I, I think you're, Yeah, I oh, think true, you're right. True. If you were trying to prove this, like by, uh, you could you, you could prove that it goes on forever by induction, right? I mean, that's that's basically what it is. So let's uh, let's combine B and D because they're basically the same. I'm convinced now. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I'm having some issues kind of just trying to wrap my head around uh, associativity and just how to prove that because I know it like it says like oh if I of I of A and B and C is equal to I of A of I and B and C yes so for yeah that's associativity you're right Yes. So I guess my issue is what is I of A and B? Because that's just plugging in our separate values for whatever our separate equations were, correct? Yeah, it's, it's using the formula for the, mm -hmm. for the intersection and then it showing that it, if, if they are indeed associative, that it doesn't matter the order that those are carried out, that you get the same result. Okay. So you're going to do I of A and B. You're going to have a you're, you're going to have a blah, and then you do mm -hmm. the intersection of that blah with C, and you get something. And then in the next case, you do the intersection of B and C. You get a big blah, and then you have to intersect it with A. Okay. And and, and hopefully those will be the same if they are the same. Now I think if you've tried these, you found out that the math is not really super trivial, is it? It's kind of uh, it, it's kind of a slogger, but I think mm -hmm. this is this is fun to do. So, if you get into problems with notation, you're going to have to require some really good bookkeeping in your math, and this is good because that sharpens your skills. It's always good to uh, to have that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Okay, next thing I wanted to talk about then was a paper that I just sent you. This is a very nice, this is a very nice paper. And it was written by a, a couple of guys who kind of pioneered swarm intelligence. And it's the Harvard Review. Typically, I try to put this online and just have you upload it, but I keep getting messages from Harvard Review that you can't do that. You can't make our paper accessible as a link on the web. But I believe I, there's no doubt in my mind that I can talk about it here and I give you individual uh, copies because this is a research, this is an instructional class. And the beautiful thing about the swarm intelligence, this is, this is from, are you ready? Ooh. This is from the Harvard Business Review. So what the heck does the swarm have to do with business? Well, according to Harvard Business Review, yeah, quite a bit. One of the interesting things is that we see a lot of swarms in, in different places. It's just a matter of applying the paradigm to where you want it to go. I know that in business, um, I have a student, um, Eric Holloway, where he's, he's, he's graduated, he's a PhD right now, that has been dinking around with swarm intelligence and how ideas spread in populations. And if you think about that, that is a kind of a swarm intelligence sort of problem. How do ideas spread in population? This would be especially important to people, for example, that want to establish a brand. They want to get their publicity out there. What is the best way to perform this? Another application to people is crowd control. If you have if you have a situation where you're doing some architecture and you want to make sure that the evacuation from the building is going to be orderly in case there's a fire or some other sort of emergency, you can apply um, swarm intelligence in order to uh, kind of test this empirically. In other words, come up with your model and your exits and, and make some assumptions about how the panic will spread and what people will do and get an idea of what will happen. Also, if you think about it, there are a lot of things in the economy that are controlled by a, a simple knob. The Federal Reserve Board, I don't understand everything they do. I know they print money and they do other stuff, but one of the things they do is they have this little knob and this knob controls the interest rate, right? That they charge the Federal Reserve's bank. And they look at the economy and they, they click it up a little bit, they click it down a little bit <clears throat> in accordance to what they think will, will help the economy. 
And if you think about it, this is a big economy that is controlled in a way by this single parameter, which is the interest rate, which the Federal Reserve Board has under its control. And that's that's exactly what swarm intelligence is. It's it's simple rules. In this case, a single simple rule. Click click. And um, so there's other there's other applications in here in terms of business. Uh, let's scroll down and maybe look at one of them. Um, Let's see, I think this was one. Um, well, first of all, this goes through the, the advantages of uh, swarm intelligence. One of the things about swarm intelligence is that it's incredibly robust to decimation. That is, you can take a swarm and you can knock out a third, to the, a third of the agents and the swarm kind of will still work. I mean, that, that's true in any swarm. It's, it's wonderfully robust. And I used to worry about swarming drones and some of the military people that are looking at, at swarming drones say that there's gonna be up to a, a million agents in the swarming drone. Wow, I don't know, that's, that's kind of too many for me to believe, but I can't imagine hundreds or thousands of elements in a swarming drone. And what do you do if a, if a drone attacks you? Uh, what, are you, what are you going to do? You're going to take them out one at a time. And, um, and I, the thing that has put my mind at ease right now is that we do have a technique using EMPs that allow us to deal with drone swarms. You can't take them out one-on-one -on -one because there's just too much happening. You, uh, you can't take them out um, drone on drone you can't take them out with a little laser that goes from drone to drone and goes zap 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 but an emp a properly applied will be like a bug spray go into the drone swarm and take all the drones out at the same time by frying their electronics so i think this is a very interesting uh, a very interesting countermeasure to swarming drones which used to give me the chills along with emps emps still give me the chills I, I don't know why our country isn't trying to harden against EMPs, but eh, that's a topic for another day. Um, so they're, as you can see here, they're, they're, they're flexible. This is in general, they're robust, and they do self-organization. Now, this self-organization is what I would call a, um, an emergent property, that they have emergent properties that all of these swarm elements working together with very, very simple rules have a very nice emergent property. Uh, so th th there's a number of interesting solutions in here. Um, there's a definition of swarm intelligence here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, well, here's one, for example. This is setting rules for companies. I, I'm reading a book now or listening to a book called uh, Influence, and they talk about establishing very simple rules to do, uh, to motivate companies. And it's really interesting that you can go in and establish a few simple rules and get all of your employees to adhere to these rules and it will really improve the performance of your company. Now, those rules are gonna be independent of the company, but this is, this is done all the time. Um, this, this one you can see is, let's see, came up, Don, Don, Donahue came up with four basic guidelines to ensure that everyone in his organization was working towards the same goal. And he came up with these four different rules. And this is kind of like the rules of uh, swarm intelligence, except applied to, uh, except applied to a, an organizational structure. And if you look at these, yeah, these kind of make sense. This is what you would want if you had, if you had a good organization, but application of the rules and not only that, but enforcement of the rules. There are other examples in here such as how we can learn from swarms to do things like paint trucks, uh, to get better, um, better employee performance at places like Amazon, um, and uh, some, some other very interesting applications. So let me, um, let me explain, for example, how we can learn from swarm intelligence, how to get better business performance at Amazon. One of the ways Amazon used to run, according to 
the, the, the business review is that you had different people which were responsible. I, this was before the automation. You know that Amazon is totally automated now. They have little robots which go around and they, and they pick up the items and they put it in a basket. Then they bring it to humans and the humans take the basket, take the individual elements and put them into boxes, which is interestingly a seemingly very simple cat task, which hasn't been automated as of yet. So it's still humans placing these things in the boxes. But as far as going towards these different stalls and bringing out the, uh, uh, bringing out the results and um, uh, putting them on the, um, putting them on the conveyor belt, all of that is done automatic, uh, uh, automatic right now. So instead of Amazon, since my example has changed over the years, let me go to Subway. Anybody here been to the Subway sandwich place? I don't know if you've ever been to that where it's very, very busy. And what happens is that you have somebody that's in charge of cutting your bread and putting it in the oven if you want it to toasted. Then there's another person that uh, you takes it out and it gets your vegetables. And then there's a third person which uh, charges you the money, right? The cash, re cash register sort of thing. The problem with that is that you can have a, a weak link if the person, for example, putting on the condiments, you know, the, the lettuce and the tomatoes and everything on the sandwich is really slow, what does that do to the process? The weakest link slows down the whole process. So what can one do about it? Well, uh, the swarm intelligence people said we need to go no longer to look at the so-called leaf cutter ant. The leaf cutter ant does something very interesting. As their name implies, they cut leaves, right? And they cut little pieces of leaves and they want to get those leaves from point A to point B. And as a result, they put up a little conga line. Now, what they do is one ant carries the leaf to the next person in line. And then when they meet, he hands that new ant the leaf and then that ant goes on. And then when the person, when the ant gives off the leaf, they turn around and they go back and they go back ever how far they need to go to meet the ant that's behind them in order to pick up a new leaf. Do you get the idea? Now, if you think about this for a minute, what that does is that cuts out the weakest link. If everybody is always working, you have this, you have this little ant, leaf cutter ant, which is really sluggish, and he doesn't move very far. So he picks up a leaf, carries it a little bit, hands it off, and then he slogs back slow. Oh, there's another leaf. Okay, I'm going to do that. And the fast ants are still going to go, hand off a leaf, go back. But the overall process is not delayed. So how could you apply this to the Subway sandwich shop? One of the ways is to not relegate individual responsibility to each one, to, to the three different people. The idea uh, application of the leaf cutter ant is to um, is to have number one do the thing it needs to do, hand it off to number two, and then number two when they're done they hand it off to number three, and if three gets or if three gets early they come back and they um, they take over. So the challenge is in the subway example is that everybody has to be trained in all three of the things because you could have in an instant, all two of the people putting on different toppings at the same time, right? But that makes it much more efficient and makes things get through much quicker. So that was a swarm intelligence uh, motivated operation. Um, another place where this is used is in <clears throat> uh, optimization. There is a, a algorithm called uh, ant colony optimization. It was pioneered by a guy named Duringo, and it uses the basic idea of foraging ants and their laying a pheromone in order to solve problems. Uh, let me give you an example. If uh, you have an ant, you, you've, see, you've seen the line of ants coming to your Milky Way bar and then turning around and taking little pieces of the Milky Way bar back to their nest, right? And, and so they, they come and they go, how do they figure out what that line is? They do it by laying out pheromone. So when the ant has the Milky Way bar and it's going back, it deposits a chemical 
And that chemical evaporates with respect to time. The chemical evaporates with respect to time. But if that path is, is, is renewed again and again and again by pheromone, then that path is going to remain strong. What the other ants do is they follow the longest sniffing, the, 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 the strongest pheromone. We see this, for example, in bacteria. Sometimes bacteria, they migrate in a Petri dish towards the gradient of the nutrient. So if the nutrient is getting strong, it migrates to the nutrient. It goes along the gradient to the path. That's what ants do. They look at the pheromone and they go, the pheromone is strongest in this direction, so I'm going to follow the pheromone. And then as they follow the pheromone, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because they lay down pheromone themselves and reinforce the, reinforce the path for the next ant. If you ever want to have fun, and I've done this, I when I was in Swarm Intelligence, I first came to Baylor, and I, you know, we have fire ants all over the place. So I was I was outside and I was kind of bent over looking at these fire ants. And I, I, I love Baylor's Christian identity because somebody came along and said, Sir, are you okay? <laughs> it looked like it looked like that I was sick and throwing up or something, because I was just I was just looking at the ground and uh, they thought I was probably sick, but no, I was observing them. But if you ever want to have fun and you see one of these lines of ants, uh, take some saliva or a little bit of water and disrupt the path. Put a little river in front of the path. And if you put a little river in front of the path, you wipe away the pheromones and you'll see the ants come up to where you have disrupted the path and they don't know what to do. They just kind of look around and you know they, they, they wander around saying, gosh, where'd the pheromone path go? And it's fun. If you want to mess with the minds of ants, you can do it that way. Um, so that, 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 that's the way that ants do it. Now, here's, here's, what's, here's what I think is also interesting. I'm going to pin myself here and use my, um, use my overhead cam and, and just give you a picture here. Here's something else about the paths. And just from what I described, I think you can probably figure this out. You have a little river here and you have a bridge across the river and then the river goes on. And you have another bridge across the river. And here is the Milky Way bar. And here is home. Now, the ants have two ways to get across this little stream of water, right? They have two ways to get across this stream of water. They can either go over this bridge or they can go over this bridge. Now, from what I just described, what do you think will happen in steady state? There's going to be some transients here, but what's going to happen in steady state to those ants in their little line getting from the Milky Way bar to home? Can anybody guess? Which bridge will they choose and why? Well, they're probably going to use the bridge on the right because it's the shortest total distance. It's the shortest, but what in there? See, the ants are really dumb. Remember, we're, we're having dumb bugs do smart things. The only thing they can do is sniff out the pheromone. What in that rule is going to dictate that they always go to the right? So I think the first couple of ants are probably going to pick one at random. Yep. And then the ants that go all the way to the left bridge, by the time they get back, their pheromones are going to be really weak because exactly. it's been so long. Exactly. And then the other ones are still going to be strong. They are going to choose this bridge because the pheromone across this path evaporates, uh, evaporates much more slowly than the ones across this path because of the length, because of the length of the trip, because of the length of the trip the shorter distance is always going to win out because the pheromone scent is going to be stronger. And that's what happens in steady state. Isn't that interesting? The answer is yes, that is interesting. Now, here's, here, here's another thing. Suppose that you don't want to get, um, that you don't want to get just the Milky Way bar, but you want to do something like make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, okay? So what you have in this example <clears throat> is you have peanut butter here, you have jelly here, 
and you have bred down here. And then you have home over here. So here's the story now. You have to start at home, but you need to collect the peanut butter and jelly and the bread before you go back home again. Okay. You're not just getting the single Milky Way bar. You're getting three components of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Got it. Um, and what do you think? Well, you know, the, the, the original problem solved by the, um, by the pheromone is that it solved the shortest distance between two points, which is a straight line, right? And this was a generalization of that to always get the shortest path. Well, the ants eventually, if they know that they have to pick up peanut butter, jelly, and bread, are going to find the shortest path uh, to the jelly, the peanut butter, and the bread. It kind of looks heuristically here like it would probably be something like this, right? That's what it says heuristically. This would probably be the path that it would choose. Now, it isn't important the order that they pick it up. It's just that they have to have all three. Now, this is interesting because if you generalize it, let's just talk about not peanut butter, jelly, and bread, but you have something like all of these dots here. Uh, Dr. Marks, you're starting to go off the Okay, page. thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, keep me honest here. So you have all of these dots here, and here is home. And what you have to do is you have to visit all of these dots and then go back home. And you want it to be the shortest distance. Does anybody know, to, know this problem? It's, it's one of the ones that's used quite a bit in computer science. Is this Depending Backstra's on... algorithm? What's that? Would this be internet routing, packet routing with oh, Backstra's that, yeah, it, algorithm? It, it, it could be pouting rack. Oh, that would be kind of a VPN sort of thing, right? I don't know. Uh, no, the, the, the answer is, is this is the traveling salesman problem. The traveling salesman problem is as follows. You have a home and you have a bunch of cities that you have to visit as a traveling salesman. And the question is, what is the shortest path in order to visit all of these cities in order to get back home? It's a very difficult problem. Um, I forget, I think it's NP hard. And it, uh, it, it gets very, very difficult to solve, especially if the number of cities is very large. Now, can you see this idea up here of the peanut butter and jelly and uh, bread being generalized to this? We're baking something with a bunch of ingredients and you have to collect all the ingredients before you go back home. And indeed, this can be, this can be tackled by the, uh, by the pheromone. I'm grunting here because I'm trying to open my thermos and the lid got on too tight. Okay, I can do it. There it goes. Okay. Wow. <clears throat> I guess when you put the lid on your thermos that it contracts and kind of sucks the lid in more tightly. Okay. At least that's my excuse. So do you see that? This is again, the traveling salesman problem. And if you look at the traveling salesman problem on the, on the, on the web, Uh, you, will, you will find out some very interesting results. Now, for large numbers of cities in the traveling salesman problem, um, well, sometimes you could figure this out, but the number of solutions goes up incredibly as the number of cities increases linearly. So we have, we have an incredible problem here. Now, does the laying of the pheromone by the ants solve this problem? No, but like most solutions, it gets a, it gets a solution which is pretty good. Okay. It isn't the optimal solution. There's one, only one optimal solution here, but uh, they it can actually get uh, results, which are very, very close to being kind of cool. Okay. So that's, that's an example of foraging. 
Um, next thing I wanted to do, you know, this pheromone thing, this, this, this you know, in, in artificial intelligence, even if you have simple rules, things can go bad. And here is an example of way, ways that things can go bad with the pheromone. Let's see if I have this here. Yeah, this is army ants trapped in a death circle. Can all of you see that uh, YouTube video? Okay. So what do you think is happening here? All the ants are following the strongest pheromone path, aren't they? And you can see it said on a, the, the other screen, I didn't know this. Some of these ants run around in circles until they just die of exhaustion. Since they're all trying to follow the strongest pheromone path. But um, this is where this uh, simple swarm algorithm could go bad, right? But I think you can see that every once in a while you can have applications of any of these algorithms and not do a very good job and you get things happening which you don't want to happen. Okay. I thought that was, <laughs> that was very interesting. Again, it follows this paradigm that they are following their own pheromone scent. And as they follow the pheromone scent, they reinforce that pheromone scent as they go around in circles. And they will just continue to go around in circles forever. So that's a little bit, a little bit about the ants and the ant colony, op, ant colony optimization uh, invented by Durango. Now, there's other applications of, uh, of ants in swarms, and I want to go back and share uh, some results from the, from the neoswarm.com, or is it neoswarm.org? I think it's neoswarm.com. Okay, that's good. Com is a lot better. I want to show you, first of all, something called gnats. Now, I want you to look at this result. Look at this little video, and this will look like gnats that are flying in front of your in front of your face on a hot summer day, and you kind of swat them away, right? That's the reason it's called gnats. Now I want you to look at this and see if you can figure out what simple rule this is following. Uh, could it be? If your uh, minimum distance to another gnat is too large, you turn around. No, it has nothing to do with the distance to another gnat, but you're but you're kind of close. I want you to notice, and this is a little bit of a hint, that every once in a while, one of the gnats has a little red circle appear around it, just really quickly. And I will give you another hint. This is not biologically motivated. Well, here's the solution. Uh, each one of the gnats has kind of a directional drift associated with it. And that as soon as the gnat becomes the maximum distance of all of the other gnats from some sort of centroid, it turns around and begins to drift exactly the opposite way, like it bounced off a wall. See if, see if you can see that now. So do you see the little red circles which instantaneously appear around one of the gnats? They're kind of sporadic, but they're identifiable. So that's it. You just have a bunch of random gnats. The one that is farthest away from the centroid is the one that's kind of reflected back into the swarm in order to give this appearance of swarming gnats you would swat away on a hot summer night. Now, is there an emergent property behind this? Yeah, there is. It's, it's a little bit interesting. I'll share it with you, the emergent property. One is, what if you start all of the gnats in the middle? If you start all of the gnats in the middle, what happens to the emergent property? Well, it turns out these gnats, this, this circle, kind of an implied circle, begins to increase 
and slowly increases and will eventually, I'll skip ahead here, and it will slowly increase and it will get to the point where uh, it is exactly the same radius as the example that I showed before. It's slowly getting bigger. So that radius of the circle is kind of an emergent property and is a function of the number of nants, nats and the velocity of each one of the meanderings of the ants. So this circle is getting about as big as this circle up here. That's where, that's where it's going. It still has a little ways to go. And this is even true if you start on the other end. Let's go to the end just and see what happens here. Well, don't want to make it too big here. What happens if we go to the end of that? Yeah, we start to see the circle getting pretty closely. It, it's going kind of slowly, but eventually we'll get there. What if you start with the ants all scattered out? If they're all scattered out, many of them even off the screen, what will happen? Even here, there is an emergence that the circle shrinks to the original, the original circle, and it does so very, very quickly, right? So the steady state radius of this is, eh, it looks kind of like an emergent property of, of this particular swarm activity. Okay, let's uh, let's look at some other ones. Oh, this one is kind of interesting. This isn't necessarily swarm, but it's a sand pile. And the reason this is interesting is I read in a book called Ubiquity that if you look at things like avalanches, for example, it's like dropping one piece of sand at a time on an ant hill, on an ant hill, uh, on a sand pile, and you drop one piece of sand at a time. Sometimes there's going to be a little avalanche of sand. Other times there's going to be an instability which builds up into the sand pile. And there's going to be the equivalent of an avalanche. And this is, this is something which is characteristic of avalanches. So this is what happens if you start with uh, just dropping a piece of sand. Every time a new piece of sand is dropped, you can see that there's a little bump that happens here. And the time between bumps is the degree of the avalanche. If there's a lot of time between the bumps, there are big avalanches. If, there, if, if the bumps occur, bump, bump, if they occur very, very quickly, that means the avalanche wasn't that good. And the rule here is very simple. Uh, the sand falls if there is a, a neighboring region that is lower than what the sand is. So if you have a, if, well, something happened there. I don't know what. Um, so if you have sand up here and one of, the, one of the pixels, if you will, has a lower sand, that sand begins to fall. And then it applies the rule again. If there is a lower value of sand around that new pixel, it falls. And this was a model that was proposed for this. Now, this is a young pile just starting. And I was kind of disappointed in this because I thought that I would see some very nice avalanches and I didn't see any avalanches. There wasn't the variety that I expected. And in fact, <clears throat> by the way, this one big peak back here is just put here in order to, for scaling purposes. So just ignore that. And down here is a very mature, a very mature pile. And with this mature pile, there is a avalanche, but for each case, if there is an avalanche, sand is gonna fall off the little box. So we lose sand as it falls off the box if, if the avalanche hits the bottom. And so with this very, very simple rule, which describes, it isn't swarm intelligence, but it is a simple rule that describes things such as avalanches. Uh, we see that uh, this is the number of elements in the avalanche. And we can see there's kind of some bigger avalanches here, but they're really not pronounced. I would have 
I would like to see these like five or 10 times as big as kind of the small ones, but you know, it's, um, there, there are some teeny, teeny, uh, avalanches, which occur. Okay. With this, let's get to something else. Uh, let's get, oh, this, this one I think is the most fascinating. This is bullies and dweebs. This is a very common swarm intelligence implementation. You have bullies which try to beat up on dweebs and they're usually referred to as predator prey sort of problems. Um, the problem with that is predator prey, I have to think too long about that. So I just call them bullies and dweebs, okay? The bullies are the ones that try to ignore the dweebs. So here's the simple example. We're gonna put a bunch of dweebs. They are the blue boxes here. We're gonna put a bunch of uh, dweebs and then the bullies are gonna be these little red triangles. Do you see one here? Can you see my cursor? It points to, it points to a little, um, it points to a little uh, red diamond here. And those are the bullies. Here is the rules. The bully looks for the closest dweeb and takes a step, a fixed step towards the dweeb, okay? The dweeb takes a look at the closest bully and takes a step away from the bully. So the dweebs run from the bullies. The bullies are pursuing the dweebs at the same rate, at the same performance. And this is what happens. Now, there's a couple of, it's, frankly, it's not very exciting. Uh, but one of the interesting things is in history, swarm intelligence has been applied to the military quite a lot. We talked about the military drones, but it turns out historically, Alexander the Great, when he was conquering the world, lost one of his battles due to swarm intelligence. And th that swarm was a bunch of mounted Sith soldiers that came down and they didn't fight the way that you should in a big phalanx, you know, army facing army sort of thing. They just came down and they were riding their horses and they took bows and went whoop, whoop, whoop. And they, they came in and they retreated. And so there was kind of this randomness associated with it. And Alexander didn't lose the battle. It was one of his generals. But... Um, they figured out, um, well, we lost that battle. What can we do against this, this, these mounted Sith warriors, which were coming down like a swarm and attacking? <clears throat> well, their solution, which is kind of obvious, is to um, do something which you've seen in the movies. Say that you have a big field that you want to search for a dead body, and a little kid has died, and you want to see if that, that kid is in the field. You get a bunch of volunteers and they line up and you all take hands and you walk slowly across the field looking down to see if there's anything there. Does that make sense? Well, this is basically what Alexander did. He took his army and he lined it up and began to pursue the Sith warriors. And they basically uh, backed up against a river and they had nowhere to go. So because they blocked them all and they got them all nice and vulnerable, they were able to kill them all and in this swarm insurgents that had made them lose the battle. But notice one of the implications here. One of the implications is that the, um, is that the Sith warriors would all be killed at the boundary, at the boundary of the battlefield. They couldn't go into the river. They were killed at the boundary of the battlefield. And this is what happens in this simulation. If you look real closely, and let's see, I don't know if you can see it on this, probably not. No, we'll see it, we'll see it elsewhere. But there will be little white crosses where everybody died. You can do you see the little white cross right there? It's just very, very subtle. I hope that it comes through. Does it come through? Do you see it? Okay, a little white cross. That means that's where the where, where a dweeb has died. And what we're going to find out is in these predator-prey solutions, just like in Alexander's army, a lot of the deaths occur on the boundary where the bullies chased the dweebs into a boundary. The dweebs had no place to go, and so they, um, they, they just died. Now, let's make this a little bit interesting. We have a second scenario now of bullies and dweebs, except this time the dweebs are going to do something a little bit different. 
they are going to take a step away from the bullies and do a little bit of random shuffle. We're going to use a random number generator to not only have it take a step away from the bully, but also do a little step to the right or the little step to the left or even keep in the middle. Is that okay? And I'm going to call this twiddle. We're adding twiddle to the dweebs. So the dweebs have a little bit of randomness as they run away. And this makes it much more interesting. Let's see what happens if we add a little bit of twiddle. If we add a little bit of twiddle, the dweebs all of a sudden are much more difficult to catch, right? And you will notice in this battle, as you follow the bullies, that again, most of the deaths, most of the killing of the dweebs are at the boundaries of the battlefield. There's a few uh, infield kills. You can see the white circles here, but a lot of white circles, white crosses, but many of those white crosses were due to the initial setup and what happened there. Now, to follow things a little bit more precisely, this is a case where we have, um, well, one bully. We actually have two bullies here. We have a bully here and a bully here, and the rest are dweebs. So we're just going to watch what happens with two bullies as they pursue the dweebs. So you can see that the bully follows the dweebs to the boundary. And this totally is unexpected. Think of the simplicity of the rules here and this very interesting emergent property. But the bully pursues the, um, the dweeb to a corner and usually gets a kill on the boundary of the battlefield. And because of the twiddle in the dweebs, he only gets one kill per boundary. Whereas before, you could have a bunch of dweebs on top of each other and one dweeb kill would be, I don't know, uh, four or five dweebs stacked on top of each other because that's allowed in this scenario. Dweebs were allowed to stack on each other. So this goes on for a while and uh, the pattern is just kind of repeatable. There's a randomness associated with it, so it isn't exactly the same every time, but the bully picks off one dweeb at a time. Oh, <laughs> no place to go. Now, the interesting thing, if the twiddle worked well in the dweebs, would it work well in the bullies? right? Well, if you try to do uh, twiddle on the bullies, add a little bit of randomness to their walk, uh, to their step towards the nearest dweeb, it looks like they're actually drunk, as you'll see here. You'll see that they kind of chase a dweeb for a while, and oftentimes can't even chase the, can't even catch the dweeb because the dweeb and the bully just can't get synced together. Sometimes it catches it, sometimes it doesn't. So you can see that one dweeb is just running away from the bully and saves itself because of the randomness of the situation. So <clears throat> my characterization of this emergent property is that the bully looked like it was drunk. <laughs> it's almost comical. You can, you kind of say, go dweeb, you can do it, you can do it, you can make it. And that one, that one dweeb you can see has just gotten away from the bully many, many places. Oh, there the bully finally got the dweeb. And now he's, he's chasing the other dweeb, which is closest to him. And no, I'm not being sexist. Bullies are all male. Now, at this point, the two bullies are chasing the same dweeb. And that makes it that makes it much more effective, as we'll see. And again, I'd remind you of the simplicity of the rules. 
a little bit of randomness. A bully takes a step towards the nearest dweeb. The nearest dweeb takes a step away from the nearest bully, plus a little bit of twiddle. Very, very simple rules in this predator prey sort of operation. Okay, that's probably enough. Now, here's the interesting thing. A few bullies with twiddle are very ineffective. But what happens if you get a bunch of drunks together and put them together, they become a mob. And this is what happens in this, in this case. We have a lot more bullies, and these bullies are going to congregate and become a mob and be incredibly efficient in killing dweebs many more times. So we just start out here. The bullies begin to congregate and they begin to chase the same dweebs. And you can see they're kind of grouping together in a little mob. So all of those bullies in the mob are chasing the same dweeb at the same time, if you will. And notice the dweebs have a very difficult time getting away because they don't know how to negotiate. They don't know how to posture themselves in order to get away from the bullies. So there's lots of mass killings because the bullies, all with a little bit of twiddle, are able to take care of the dweebs. Now, this is the same exact rules that I had for the drunk bully, except that we have more drunk bullies at this point. Okay, there's something, this is another interesting, uh, interesting phenomena. When the bullies are paralyzed, the dweebs retreat to the Veroni partition. How many have heard of the Veroni partition? Oh, okay, Colin has. Okay, Veroni partition. Anytime you have a bunch of dots, you have a Veroni partition. What this Veroni partition does is it separates the plane into this triangle. Can you see my cursor? Okay. You see, the, you see this little region, which is kind of a triangle. Inside this region are all of the points which are closest to this bully. All of the elements here are the points which are closest to this bully. And all of the points up here, there's only one in the boundary here, but all of the points up here are closest to this point. And any, anytime you have a... a um, a collection of points, you can make this Veroni partition and separate it into different regions where each region consists of all of the points closest to the interior point of the whatever figure that is. And so this is a natural emergent property of the uh, bullies and dweebs. Now I say it's paralyzed dweebs because I'm not having this dweeb move. So let's run it again. Okay, that's, that's really quick. So they all run to the Veroni partition. They're trying to get as far away from each one of the bullies as possi they possibly can. And as a result, and you think about it, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Running away from, the, from this is really, uh, yeah, it, it, th this is what should happen. You should get the Veroni partition if you think about it a little bit. Okay, I don't like these. Okay, I want to show you these. Those, those are no good. Okay. So I want to show you one thing that we did. It's in war games. And in war games, what we did is we took, we took a bullies and dweebs scenario. And we made it a little bit more complicated. I don't want to go into that, but we we did a little of evolutionary adaptation of each of, well, here of the dweebs. So the bullies remain the same. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to evolve the dweebs so that they lasted, so that the swarm lasted as long as they can, as long as they possibly could. And we, um, we tweaked it by an evolutionary search. We'll talk about evolutionary searches later on. And one of the remarkable results that came to this as we evolved this evolutionary search is the following is the following interesting scenario where in order for the dweeb, the dweeb swarm to survive, 
the dweebs chose to have self-sacrifice. They literally sacrificed themselves one at a time in order to maximize the lifetime of the, uh, of the swarm. And I found out that this was very fascinating. So we'll watch this now, and it'll take a second for it to, to come out. There's a little bit of transience here. But there's the bullies, and they're chasing the dweebs. And do you see what's happening? The bully is actually chasing that same dweeb around again and again and again. And it's going to follow that dweeb until it kills the dweeb. And so that dweeb has sacrificed itself so that the overall swarm would last as long as it possibly could. This was a totally unexpected result, but if you look at it, it makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of time eaten up by those bullies going around and capturing or looking at that dweeb. Okay, you can see that the bully captured the dweeb and now it's gonna kind of self-select another self-sacrificing dweeb and there it is. Okay, we have another self-sacrificing dweeb. So the dweeb sacrifices itself for the overall good of the swarm. I thought this was just a fascinating result. And again, this is a result of evolutionary development of the swarm so that the, the optimization criteria is so that the swarm would last as long as it possibly could. And so it basically continues like this. And uh, eventually, eventually, yeah, the bully gets the uh, bullies get the swarm. And you notice the bullies have a little bit of twiddle in them. Uh, but again, it's kind of a self-organization that one of the bullies is selected for the next self-sacrifice. And there it is. We have the bully now selected for self-sacrifice. And he's going to eat up a bunch of time in order to maximize the survival time of the swarm uh, it maxes my, maximizes the survival time of the swarm by eating up a lot of time while the rest of the swarm kind of huddles in the corner here. One more time, and I think this, the, that'll be enough because I think you get the idea. Now, understanding the evolutionary process is beyond what we've talked about as of yet, but just know that this is, these are some of the interesting stuff that can be done. We were contracted by the Navy for some work in so-called swarm evolution. It does turn out that these simple rules have manifest um, very complex uh, emergent behaviors. And the question is, if well, if, if you have the simple rules, you can get the emergent behavior, just, just simulate it. But if you want a certain emergent behavior, how do you choose the simple rules that the swarm obeys? That is the swarm inversion process. And that is very, very difficult and very time consuming. But it is something that can be done. Okay, that's probably enough. There's some other ones here, but I, this is the most interesting one. Uh, let's do the worm search. This is very, this is very interesting. This was uh, some preliminary work for some um, automated unmanned underwater vehicles for monitoring a shallow harbor. Now, one of the things that you have to be careful for is to, well, they call it don't don't look under the uh, don't look under the lamp, don't look uh, don't look under the street lamp, and here's the story behind that. You're in a big parking lot, and the parking lot is empty, and at the side, and you can see the side here, that little red, by the side here, that uh, there's a bright light, and you need to search for your keys since you've lost your keys. Now. If you just want, what do you do? You have to search the whole, the, the, the whole parking lot here. But the problem is, is that you can really see very well close to the street lamp, right? And if you, you can think of your radius of observation as being very large at the street lamp and very small as you go out here. In other words, you're not going to be able to search over 
as large a period, a lot as large an area if you're standing far from the street lamp. So the question is, is how do you perform this operation in order to get a uniform search? You would like to have a uniform search over all of the uh, all of the space. Now, this is even more complicated when we talk about surveillance of shallow water harbors, because in shallow water harbors, if you're looking for some enemy, some enemy submerged vehicle, some UAV, uh, that UAV can move. So you even have another problem is be, just because you've searched in a specific area doesn't mean that that target can't come back and be at an area that you've already searched. So you have to assign some sort of criterion to each one of the points here is your, is your probability that your target is there. If you look, the probability it's there is uh, probability that it isn't there. If you don't see anything, it's 100%. If you're away for a long time, then that probability begins to decay. And if you haven't been there for, I don't know, 20 minutes or an hour or something like that, you have no idea what that's going to be. So let's take a look at how this sort of thing can be done. And this was done by uh, a simple swarm search, which we called worm search, and you'll see why. Here is our UAVs. Now, the, the results are pretty simple. Uh, one of the results is you want to repel yourself away from the light a little bit. So that's one of the rules, one of the simple rules. You don't want to spend all your time searching under the lamp, right? Uh, you want to repel yourself away from that wall. And that degree is a little knob you can turn. And you can, here it's called the DR, okay, the DR. And that shows how much, how much you are uh, pushing away from the light in order to look at the less probable areas. And so here's an example. So you can see the Oh, the other thing is, is if you bump into another swarm, you change direction. And these are totally autonomous individual agents, which do not communicate with each other. But they are able to find out if they're in proximity with each other. And if they're in proximity, they change direction in order to hopefully, uh, hopefully look at areas which haven't been looked at before. Now, you notice each one of the heads of the worms here has a little circle associated with it. And you can see in the upper right, those circles are much smaller in diameter than they are close to the lamp light at the bottom right, right? At the, at the bottom right, you can see a big swath because it's so well illuminated. There is also decay in the tails of the swarm. And this is kind of to measure the probability that whatever object you're looking at has re, um, has, uh, yeah, it has, it has, has re-emerged. So if the tail is very red, then that means, well, we're pretty sure that the target isn't there because we've looked at that region very recently. If, <coughs> excuse me, if the tail is blue, if the tail is blue, then that means, well, there's a, you know, we have no idea whether there's a, an enemy there or not. Well, if we looked at this and kind of did the overall coverage, we see that, well, this didn't work really good because the red means we had better surveillance near the lamplight as we, as we did far away, okay? And so the question is, let's turn up this repulsion away from the lamplight and see what, see what happens. You can see here that we have a little bit better, if you compare the top one with this one, this one has a little bit better coverage, a little bit better uniform coverage, but it still probably isn't acceptable because it's still much more highly probable on average near the bottom than it is at the top. And so, yeah, it doesn't get very exciting. Uh, here's, here's what's really interesting. If we crank it up to where we get uniform, coverage, which is about this DR is equal to 0.1, you notice that, man, the coverage isn't that good. Most of it's uniform, but most of it is in the yellow. So we really have to sacrifice the performance in order to get uniform coverage, if that's our ultimate goal. Why is that? Because we have to spend much more time in the unilluminated areas as we do in the illuminated areas. 
And here's what happens in the uniform search. And it does turn out that we get a much more uniform coverage in this case than we do before. But because we spend so much time in the dark searching for the enemy, uh, we really get a diminished coverage in terms of the in terms of the area. So the next question is, what happens if you turn up this repulsion from the light even further? In other words, shove these things into the dark. Well, if you shove these things in the dark, you get the result here. Now, it looks like this is red over here, but it really isn't red because this is a, uh, I don't know what do they call it, a heat map, which just naturally scales. And it's actually... Yeah, it, this is pretty bad. You get good coverage up in the orange, uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, if you decide that each one of the swarms needs to be pushed away from the light. Mm -hmm. And if you put, do too much pushing away from the light, you get a performance which looks like this, which is exactly what you would expect. All of, all of the units are kind of up there in the left-hand corner, and very few of them get down to the lower right-hand corner to do any search there since you're pushing it away from the light quite a bit. Again, the idea is that each one of these um, drones is well, underwater drones, UAVs. Um, each one of them is autonomous, doesn't communicate with the other one, except when they're really, really near, they know that they're near. And uh, they're operating independently in order to get this coverage of a shallow water area. So all that's kind of neat. And then there, there's other examples. I'll, I'll just show you very briefly. Uh, what happens if the light is in the middle and you, again, you push away from the light, you get about the same sort of, same sort of result. And here, this is with uh, no repulsion. This is with 0 0.25, 0 0.5. And it's really hard in this case to get a uniform coverage because up in this right-hand corner, this was about the best we could do is up in this right-hand corner, uh, you still had very poor coverage. So this again is the light is very bright in the middle. So you have a lot of coverage. You have a lot of coverage, but you don't have a lot of coverage in the blue area, which is in the dark. And I think that that's the best. And I think this was the best that we can do. And again, you get diminished returns. Okay, here's dr is equal to 0 0.150. And that's pretty uniform. But, um, oh, there's dr is equal to 0 0.2. Okay, this is a little bit overshoot. So you have to choose this swarm parameter, much like the Federal Reserve, in order to figure out what is best. Again, as the agents get further away from the light, their coverage area isn't as big. If you're looking for your keys in the parking lot, you can only see a little bit of circle as you look down at your feet. Whereas if you're under the light, you can see a lot bigger circle. Yeah, and this was work which was done for the Applied Physics Lab at the uh, University of Washington. Kind of cool stuff. And here it's over, it's overdone. Here, too much observation in the dark areas and too little in the bright areas. And you can see, at least I'm hoping that you can see, is all of the elements kind of go to the dark area and spend most of their time there. They wander into the lighted area occasionally, but not a lot. They like to spend their time in the dark areas. This is another example of kind of a swarm intelligence. Um, one more thing, I think we have five minutes left. I'll just show you this very quickly. Uh, that's greedy, okay, greedy, greedy, greedy worm search. Uh, this was an idea of kind of following along a contour. You're looking for something underwater and you want to trace it out. Now this doesn't have a specific application, but it's fine, kind of fun to look at. And so you're trying to trace it out and uh, you'll see what I mean here in a second. Can you see a face start to emerge? So what these agents are doing is they're trying to follow 
where there is an image and to um, and to illuminate that image so that we have a better a better view of what happens as opposed to just randomly filling in this image let's see if we can do any better here so hopefully you can see that once one of these little agents gets close to an element or once it gets close to the picture it kind of lingers at the picture at least that was the hope well, these are pretty short. Uh, this looks like it. No, that's the same guy. And a lot of it has to do with the radius of the uh, of the observers and other things, and the number of observers, of course. Okay, I'm getting tired of that same old guy. Let's not do that. <laughs> uh, this one is kind of, this is one of my favorite pictures of all times. There's a little monkey with glasses on. The target is shown up here on the left. And so this is much more difficult since the picture is a little bit more fine grained. But you can see each of these elements is trying to stay on the contours and trying to add blue as opposed to places that aren't good. Okay, so this, yeah, this, this, I don't know. If, if you want to, you can come here. Who is this? Oh, I think this is my friend Mohammed El Shikari. Nope, that's that's the monkey. Here, here's Mohammed. Mohammed was my good Muslim friend that I did a lot of research at, with at the University of Washington. And each of these varies, like in the number of agents that you have. Uh, in terms of the observation, you notice that some of the circles are larger than the other circles. So we do have the illumination here, which is implied, but we don't elaborate on very much. Okay, well, I think that that's probably enough. Uh, so any questions? I think we're just about out of time. Very interesting results, right? And again, the idea is that each one of these is a very, is a swarm following very simple rules following very, very simple rules. And eventually, well, not eventually, I'll be assigning it relatively soon. I would like you to choose a swarm of your own liking and to simulate it. And I would like to see what your swarm is. Because anytime you look at these, or at least a common reaction is you look at the swarm like the bullies and dweebs, and somebody says, oh, oh, you could have done this. And they're right. They, you know, you could have done this. The, the, the options are just, uh, are, are just endless. And the tuning of these swarms, the idea of tuning the swarms, doing the swarm inversion, as we talked about, is still in its infancy. And there's lots of interesting interest in the military now, uh, I believe, in doing that sort of thing, because the swarms that are sent in to different places are going to be autonomous. They're going to have to self-organize. They're going to have to, uh, to go in and do their own thing without human intervention. So the question is, is how, you know, how, how, how do we do these sort of things? Any questions at all? Uh, I was just kind of curious, like what, what kind of tools are out there for solving that, that inverse problem, going from your desired behavior and finding the you know, system of well, nonlinear ODEs that produces that? Well, yeah, well, that's, that's the question. And if you can do that, more power to you. I mean, the, uh, the work that I have done with, for example, uh, Dr. Gravania has been totally in the area of um, yeah, linear sort of stuff. So if you can find the nonlinear sort of results, ah, good luck in solving that, number one, is because you know, I know people over in the math department that spend their whole lives solving a I don't know, elliptical, something, something differential equations. And I mean, that's, that's their whole life. So once you get into nonlinear sort of stuff, you get into a problem. I did work with a while for a while with a guy named Matthew Beauregard, 
who was a PhD student now, now and I think he's the chairman of the math department at a, at a university in Texas. And uh, he had some ideas on this, but they never came out to fruition. So if you can, if you can figure out general nonlinear, um, nonlinear differential equations to model these things, and you can tune those differential equations to do that, more power to you. And I think that you could probably do that for linear differential equations or mildly nonlinear differential equations. But all of the examples that I've given you here, except for the ones that I showed you for the, uh, oh, remember the, the protector and the, uh, the bully sort of scenarios where you pick two people and they were either they were either people that were you were trying to separate, or you had a you had a hero and you had a bully, and you wanted to keep yourself between the hero and the bully. Those can be modeled with linear um, differential equations. The other ones, not. Um, I would even challenge you to look at the simple pheromone laying with the ants and come up with the differential equations that would solve the traveling salesman problem. I mean, that's, you know, that's non-trivial. So anyway, yeah, good luck if, if you want to do that. Any other questions? Okay, if not, goodbye. And uh, next time we'll work those last set of problems and uh, finish up our talk on Swarm. Okay, bye-bye.